Okay. Um, so, hi, everybody. Uh, um, okay. So, So it's uh, the last lecture, so lecture 27. Um, and so before I start the lecture, some basic logistics. So the, the final exam is on the 16th and it's a 24 hour exam like, uh, like the quizzes, it's the same format on Gradescope. Um, the exam will uh, not be curved in the specifically in the sense that there's no upper bound on the number of A's or anything like that. So you don't have to feel like you're competing with other people and you know um, sort of worry about other people cheating and things like this. Uh, just uh, you know, all you have to do is just demonstrate that, that you understand the material. Um, uh, next week is RR week. The, there will be some GSI review sessions. Uh, I'll post a schedule of them in a moment. Um, I, I'm not gonna have a review session, but I'm gonna have extra office hours. Plus I'm gonna post a video of myself solving a previous final exam in which I'm like explaining my thought process and things like that. So in the past people have found this to be in some ways more useful than a review session. And then um, one thing which I uh, recommend is for people to form study groups during RR week or in final weeks. Uh, so I've, I've made a little Excel sheet. I mean, it's just, it just a blank Google doc uh, where, you know, if, if you're having, if, if, you're, if you're not sure where to find people um, to, uh, you know, to, to study with or to talk about the material with, just, just post your name on this link and, um, and well, probably a few people will, will do that. I'll send an email about this as well. Um, and then, yeah, the exam will of course be cumulative and I will post a study sheet uh, sometime this weekend as I've been doing for the midterms with the list of all the topics and so on. So that's all I want to say about logistics. Um, any questions about this? Um, what content is the exam going to cover? Is it going to be the entire semester? Yeah, everything, everything, okay. the entire semester. Yep. Um, okay. So, so let's see. So what do I want to do in today's lecture? So I want to do one more last bit of graph theory. I want to talk about K coloring which I introduced in the previous lecture. And then I wanna just tell you a story about another interesting aspect of graph, uh, graph theory, which is planar graphs. So we won't you know, prove anything about them and this won't be on the, uh, on the final exam or anything like that, but it's just an interesting story that kind of gets at some of, some actually philosophical issues about what is a proof, what is the point of, of, of proofs in the first place. And then finally, I'll do, I'll make some sort of high level remarks uh, about the course, which is some sort of a very high level review of what the key takeaways from the course might be. Okay, so let me start by talking about uh, K coloring. So what is K coloring? So this is something we defined uh, last time. So let me, I mean, well, since I have the definition in, in last time's notes, let me just paste it here. Um, so here, let me. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so this is last time's lecture. And at the end of this lecture, we, uh, we defined uh, this concept, graph being k colorable. Um, and we looked at a few examples of, of graphs and we tried to figure out what their chromatic number might be. And uh, what I wanna do in this, um, in this lecture is prove a, a nice, quite, quite useful theorem about k, how k colorability or how the, how the chromatic number is related to the degrees of the vertices in the graph. So here's the theorem I want to prove. Theorem says uh, if G is a graph uh, with um, maximum degree D. So the maximum of the degrees of all the vertices is capital D. Uh, then the chromatic number of G, so the number of colors you need to color it is at most this maximum degree plus one. So it relates two concepts, degrees of the vertices and the chromatic number. And you know the upshot is that chromatic number seems like a relatively mysterious concept because you have to satisfy all these constraints over the edges. So let me show you the proof. So actually before telling you the proof, let me show you a cool application, which is actually, as far as I know, used. So the application, one application is to final exam scheduling. So, um, so let's say there are 20,000 undergraduates at Cal. I don't know what the number is now. It might be more than that. Uh, and let's say there are, um, so actually let me just make sure I got the numbers right for this example. Mm. Uh, let's say there are, I don't know, 4,000 upper division courses. I, I'm not sure if that's accurate, but I'm just guessing. Uh, and, and each course has uh, at most 50, students in it. Okay. And now um, each each student uh, is taking at most three upper division courses, let's say. Or actually let's make it simpler. It takes at most two upper division courses. Okay, so there are 20,000 students, there are 4,000 courses, there's 50 students per course, each student takes two courses. Now the question is, you need to make final exam slots in a way that no student has two exams at the same time. Okay, how many, uh, final exam slots are needed uh, to prevent uh, conflicts. And here a conflict means that uh, some student has two uh, exams at the same time. So uh, a conflict is when, yeah, when you, okay, it's what, it's what you think it is. And let's say these final exam slots are disjoint, so they don't overlap with each other. So this is a problem, this is a special case of a type of problem that people have to solve all the time. So 
one way we can solve this type of problem is via graph theory by making a conflict graph, okay? So define a conflict graph. So by the way, so before we do this, uh, what uh, can somebody give me any bound on the, some bound on the number of slots you need? Probably going to be like 51. Well, okay. I mean, you've looked ahead oh. to the solution, but uh, if, if you didn't know anything, what's what's one very clear bound uh, to the number of slots you would need? 4,000. 4, yeah, 4,000, right? So an easy bound is 4,000. You just make a separate slot for every exam, for every course. And then, of course, you'd never have conflicts. And so what, what we would like to do is do get away with doing this in much less than that number of slots. So we're going to find this conflict graph. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and really the, uh, um, uh, yeah, it really, I would say the, you know, modeling the question as a graph as itself requires some insight. So, so what are the vertices of the graph? The vertices are going to be all the courses. So there are 4,000 courses. And what are the edges going to be? So I'm going to say uh, two courses C1 and C2 are an edge if there is a student in both those courses. There's a student in common in both the courses. Or I mean, okay, I should phrase this. Uh, if there's a student in C1 and C2 both. Okay, so one of these 20,000 students is taking both the courses. So now the, the thing to observe is um, uh, if you have a K coloring of this graph, then that gives you a selection of final exam slots. Okay, so so this this graph is G. Let's call it. Okay. Um, so yeah, so for example, you know the, the vertices are like math fifty five, math fifty four, and then maybe some other course. I don't know what other courses are offered here. I'm guessing. I mean, that, I don't know. Let, let's just uh, okay, like physics seven and then i don't know maybe, maybe there's like in the uh i don't know 10 or something right so so i'm going to put an edge whenever there's a student who's in both courses so it's definitely a student between these two there's probably a student between uh, taking both of these there's probably a student taking both of these uh this course i'm not sure you know maybe there's some overlap with this course but maybe there's no student taking Hindi 10 and physics seven or something like that. So this is a mini example of such a conflict graph. And now the, 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 the key thing to observe is that uh, if G is uh, K colorable, uh, then K final exam slot suffice. And, and and why is that? Well, if there is if, if there's a student who's taking two courses, then that's an edge in the graph. Anytime somebody's taking two courses, that's an edge in the graph. And if the two endpoints have different colors and those are two different slots, then there's not going to be a conflict. Okay, so this is because um, uh, I mean, yeah, let's see what's, what's the easy way to say it. Um, well, uh, every edge, so, so yeah, yeah. I mean, so a conflict would correspond to an edge with endpoints of the same color.
because you know edges correspond to there being a student in the two courses and that's what define the conflict the student has two exams at the same time and so the for example this theorem immediately tells us that the number of slots you need actually has nothing to do with the 20000 students directly i mean of course more students will create more edges in this graph but it actually only has to do with this local property uh, which is the degree and now the question is what is the degree of vertices in the graph so 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 maybe the key observation is is that every vertex has degree at most 50 why does it have degree at most 50 Because there are at most 50 students in a class, and yeah. hence 50 edges in students. So. Exactly. So th there are only 50 students in a class. And so each course is only has a conflict with at most 50 other courses. And so uh, by, the, by the theorem, uh, 51 colors are sufficient. And, and that's only because the students taking two courses max, right? Yeah, so that's a great question. So let's ask what happens if you take three courses now. But before I do that, any questions about this setup? Okay, so now let's ask an interesting question. Uh, what if every student takes three courses? Well, I can define the same graph, right? You have courses, there's an edge, if there's a student between, if there's a student in common between the two courses, but now, you know, there might be more edges, right? Because the student, there are more students are taking more courses. So it's still true that the uh, chromatic number of the graph tells me the number of exam slots, but now what's the degree? So any, any thoughts on, so suppose I have a course here. This course has a, at most 50 students. So how many other courses could there be? A hundred. A hundred, yeah, great. Because each student can create at most two conflicts, right? Because each student takes at most three courses. So each student actually puts a triangle in this graph, right, at most. And so in particular, each student in a course adds at most two edges going to other courses. And so the total degree is at most 100. It's at most 100 because, you know, at most 50 students and each student creates at most two conflicts. And so the answer is that then 101 exam slots would be sufficient. I don't know if we actually, I don't think we have anywhere near this number of exam slots here. Uh, and there could be two reasons for that. So one reason is that this is just an, this, just, this theorem just gives you an upper bound. It doesn't tell you the chromatic number is equal to D plus one. It just tells you it's at most D plus one. So it could be much less. The second reason is I think here you can have an exam conflict, is that correct? That you can actually sign up for classes with an exam conflict? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. So anyway, uh, so yeah, some people had questions, so please, please ask. Um, I was just gonna comment. I think uh, it's probably there, we can have exam conflicts, but there's also, like there's a really nice structure in the graph that I think we can take advantage of because um, since two students can't normally take courses that happen at the same time of the week, that that gives us yeah. like a lot of stuff we can leverage. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah, you can use that additional structure. Mm -hmm. Somebody else also raised their hand. 
I was just going to ask um, to ask if it could be lesson 101 and uh, you answered that here. Oh yeah, so it definitely can be. So this theorem, it doesn't say this is equal to D plus one, right? So there are graphs. So by the way, can somebody give me an example of a graph with very high degree, but which is too colorable? A tree? Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, actually that's the simplest example. The simplest example is a tree, which is just a vertex with a bunch of edges coming out. As many as you want, it's always too colorable. So this theorem just gives you an upper bound. And before we prove the theorem, uh, anybody know a graph where the chromatic number is equal to D plus one? could have two vertices with a line connecting them. That's kind of key. Okay, fine. It's it sharp for uh, a single edge or even a cycle. In this case, D is one. In this case, D is two. But uh, what about for general D? Would that be with a complete graph? Yeah, the complete graph. The complete graph on D vertices This has maximum degree uh, D minus one because every vertex is connected to all the other ones, not itself. And the chromatic number, as we discussed earlier, is actually equal to D. So this theorem in general cannot be improved. For every D, there's some graph, namely the complete graph for which this theorem is actually sharp. But it's not always sharp. Oh, wait. but. Why would it be equal to uh, D plus one then? Oh, right. Well, well in, in this case, the maximum degree is D minus one. So D minus one plus one is D. So, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, okay, maybe I should use a different variable. So let's call this case sub N. And then this, is, this has maximum degree capital D equal to N minus one. And then, but the chromatic number is N which is equal to D plus one. Okay, so let, let's now prove this theorem. Okay, so it's proof. So, I mean, okay, we'll prove it by induction like most everything else we proved about graphs. So let D be some, uh, uh, be some degree. Well, or actually let, let's do it on, let's do it by induction on the size of a graph. Um, so let P of N be the statement uh, for every graph G on N vertices, the chromatic number of the graph is at most the maximum degree of the graph plus one. So, I mean, okay, I didn't define this. Let's, let's do it like this. It's a maximum of our vertices in the graph of the degree of the vertex plus one. Okay, so base case is easy. Well, one vertex, this is the only graph. So indeed, the maximum degree is zero and it's one colorable, so that's fine. Now the induction step, so, so let G be a graph on K plus one vertices uh, with maximum degree D. So I have this, I have some graph T. And now as usual, I want to produce a smaller graph and I want to use the inductive hypothesis. 
So let's say I already know how to color graphs. So, okay, assume. Okay. Um, well, the idea here is fairly simple. Let's look at the same graph we were looking at last time. So, so what I'm so what so what's a way to get a graph on fewer vertices given a graph? We can remove one of the vertices. Remove one of the vertices. So let's just pick an arbitrary vertex. Let's call it x naught. And let's uh, remove this vertex and all of its edges. So this vertex has some neighbors. Let's call them x1 and x2. And what we can do is we can just delete this vertex and then we're left with a graph on one less vertex on uh, with uh, less than with k vertices right so let x naught be an arbitrary vertex of g and now we're going to give its neighbors names let x1 through xm be its neighbors. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to delete this vertex. And now I have another graph G prime on K vertices. And that graph, for that graph, this statement is true, that it's uh, it's colorable with the number of colors that's at most its maximum degree plus one. Okay, so let G prime be G minus this vertex X naught. And now to apply the inductive hypothesis, I need two things, that it has at most k vertices, which it does. So G prime has k vertices and the maximum degree, I'm just gonna use max deg. It's kind of clear what it means of G prime cannot be bigger than the maximum degree of G, right? Which is D. Deleting a vertex cannot increase the degrees. So now by the induct by the induction hypothesis, I can color G prime. Um, so there's some coloring F prime. So, so, okay, so I guess I need, it goes from the vertices of G prime. So let's give, that a name. So let G prime be V prime E prime. There's a coloring from the vertices of G prime one through K with K at most D plus one. So now by induction, I've colored G prime. So I'm, I've almost colored the graph, but I haven't colored X naught. And now I have to figure out how to extend this to a coloring of the whole, gra whole graph. This graph X now is a new color. Color of the new color, yeah, great idea, right? So now, so extend F prime to a coloring or to a function. We don't know it's a coloring yet, it's a function. F from V to one through K. So I guess G has vertices V, E. We should have said that earlier, maybe. Um, and extend just means, okay, F of a vertex Y is equal to just F prime of Y if Y is one of the vertices that's in both the graphs. But then there's this new vertex. And now I have to color this new vertex some color that's different from the colors of all of its neighbors. And this is the punchline. So I'm going to let f of y be uh, the first color in 1 through k minus 
Now I want to color it, give it a color that's different from the colors of all the neighbors, right? But now the beauty of this is that I, I actually have on the table what the colors of the neighbors are because F prime gave, gave some colors to the neighbors. So I'm just going to remove the colors of the neighbors from this set. Okay. Now, this is not, you know, really the, the key point is why can I always do this? So what if this set is empty? What if all the colors are used up? So why can't that happen? If that were the case, we would have D plus one different vertices that are adjacent to X zero, which would be false because then we would have a vertex with degree greater than the maximum degree. Yeah, so, okay. So, you, I mean, you're kind of saying it in a contrapositive or contradiction kind of a way, but, but, but the key point is that this set is non-empty because M, which was the number of neighbors of X naught is strictly less than K because K is equal to, uh, oh, sorry. Um, okay, I see. Uh, no, let's, let, let's, let's, uh, okay. <laughs> if I chosen K to be less than D plus one, I'd run into trouble. So let me do something funny here. Let me do K equals D plus one. <laughs> Why not, right? So if there's a coloring with less than D plus one colors, it's also a coloring with D plus one colors. Right, I just don't use some of the colors, that's fine. And now this is the key point. There is some unused color because the number of colors is bigger than the number of neighbors. And now, the, now okay, now you just check that this F is a coloring. So F, is a valid coloring of G prime and of all of these edges, X naught, X one, all the way up to X naught, X M. Uh, so F is a valid coloring of G. That's it, it's not, it's not a very complicated proof. Now we did have to be careful about uh, a few things here. Uh, like one important thing that happened in this proof from the point of view of proof writing is it was very important to name these neighbors. As in, you know, it was important to delete this vertex X naught uh, uh, in order to get the smaller graph G prime, but it was important to keep track of what the neighbors were. Uh, this is a common thing in graph uh, induction and in graph theory proofs by induction. Um, yeah, okay, I guess there isn't anything really that much more subtle about this proof, but any, any comments? I have a question. Normally when we do induction, like we prove the base case and then we assume N and prove N plus one. Why are we yeah. assuming like N and then working down from N plus one? Right, so, so okay, it's a good point. So, so in the logical structure is that we are assuming PK and then we're proving PK plus one. So the logical structure is the same as the usual induction proof. But remember in an induction proof, in order to use the inductive hypothesis, you often need to find an object of one size smaller, right? And in graph theory, the way we often do that is by deleting a vertex. So it looks like we're going down and we are going from a bigger graph to a smaller graph. But really what we're doing is we're expressing a relationship between a big graph and a small graph. So we can use induction to deduce PK plus one from PK. So logically we are still going up in K, but in order to make the connection between PK and PK plus one, you often have to delete a vertex. So this is again, 
we discussed this in chapter five. This is, you know, you can view induction as being top down or bottom up. Often when you do the proof, the implications are going, you know, from K to K plus one to K plus two and so on. But in the proof of the inductive step, you have to go from a bigger object to a smaller object. So in the induct, but we proved in the inductive step goes both ways. It's not one one way if, right? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. In this case, th for this statement, it's a type of statement that is, the other implication is also true, that PK plus one implies PK because of the nature of coloring. That if you color a big graph and then you delete a vertex, you also color, you have you also have a valid coloring of the smaller graph. So it's closed, uh, the property doesn't go away if you delete a vertex. Although, I don't think we've proved the statement with the quantifiers. Uh, I don't think it's completely obvious that PK, your, 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 your question is, does PK plus one imply PK, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's not totally obvious, right? So uh, it requires a proof. What would the proof be? So assume PK plus one. Now you, now you want to prove PK. Okay, you take a graph, you take a graph with K vertices. And now you do have to do something. You probably have to add a vertex or something like that, right? To use PK plus one. So you could do that, but we didn't do that. We did something different. Uh, yep. Okay, so yeah, so, so the key point was that this was non empty. This is where the, the degree bound was used. And you know, one remark I wanna make about this and the proof of, the, of Euler's theorem is that these proofs give us algorithms for actually computing these things. This is actually an algorithm for finding a coloring of a graph. It's a recursive algorithm for finding a color. If, you're, if you know what recursive algorithms are, or if you've written code, you can turn this into a piece of code for finding a coloring of a graph. Similarly, the proof of Euler's theorem is also actually an algorithm, right? It tells you how to find the tour. It says, use the lemma to find a cycle, then delete it, and now recurse on the rest of the graph. So these inductive proofs on graphs actually, they don't just tell you why the statement is true. They actually often give you a way to find the coloring or the tour or whatever it is. Okay. Um, so any more comments, questions? Okay, so that that's all I want to say about coloring for now. I, I, I should, um, yeah, okay. Uh, so I want to say a little bit about planar graphs. So one motivation for planar graphs, which I think is maybe the origin of how the subject started, was the following: was the question of uh, coloring maps. Okay, so um, so let's see here. Okay, so here, here's a map of the US. And, and you can ask this question, how many colors do you need to color the states so that no two states have adjacent, have the same color? So this is something that map makers actually need to do. So it's also related to coloring. So how many colors are needed so no to adjacent states have the same color. This question goes back to at least the 1800s. Okay, so now you you know you can try to do this, right? You can you can start assigning colors to this graph, like. Uh, can start saying like, okay, one, but now the neighbors can't 
be the same. So this is two, this is three, this is four. And then now, okay, you have to make some decisions, right? Maybe this is three. Um, I guess you can use one again here. So, I mean, it looks like I wasted a color actually. I don't need this to be four. Maybe I could make, oh no, I just erased the whole graph. graph. Oops, okay. Uh, let, let's make this one. And then, you know, you can continue like this and you can ask, well, how many do you end up actually needing? And the thing is, you can you can pose this as a graph theory problem. You can make a graph out of any map by making each state a vertex. And connecting two vertices if the two states are adjacent in the map. And then this question really is, what's the chromatic number of this graph G? So you can ask this question in general. So of course, for one map, you can, you know, you can try to do your best. Um, I'm not sure what the chromatic number of this graph actually is. So let's see, is it, so, uh, okay. So it has to be at least three because of this triangle over here. You can't do it in less than three. I don't know if there's some reason why you need four. Let's see, is there some situation where four state, this, this looks like a bad situation here, right? This, 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 and this. Oh no, these are not all adjacent. Are there any four states that are adjacent to each other? Mm, there's definitely some stuff happening over here. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure. Okay. <laughs> Does anybody know what the chromatic number of the map of the US is? According to the power of the internet, it's four. It is four. Okay. Do we see why it has to be four? Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, this situation this point, right? These four states all touch each other. I don't know, is that a city at that intersection point? Like what is, is there literally- it, It's a, literally, it's, it's a post in the ground and uh -huh. they call it the four corners. Okay, good. So so and that's you a- can like a dollar to see it. You, you can pay a dollar to see it. Okay, nice, yeah. So, okay, so, so then you definitely need four colors, right? Because there's a complete graph on four vertices in here. Okay, so so if you want to ask this question in general, you can you can ask this question. Uh, and the right abstraction is notion of a planar graph. So here's a definition: a graph um, G is planar if um, it can be drawn in the plane with uh, with vertices being points and uh, edges being curves. Such that no two curves cross. Okay. Now, um, well, okay. So, uh, I 
actually, okay, if we define it this way for maps, uh, okay, so I, okay, so I, I actually want to define adjacent in a different way in order to get this to work. So adjacent uh, in more than one point. So then actually th this example goes away. Okay, I guess there's no way to erase that. Okay, good. Hmm. Yeah, okay, so th th that's just a cycle. So I don't, okay, I don't exactly see why it's four. And um, if, if you define uh, for any map, like a geographical map, if you define a graph this way, then it's, it's by definition uh, planar because, um, well, okay, I mean, I guess that actually requires a proof. Um, Okay, I, I don't want to. I guess I don't want to prove that right now. But um, uh, it can be shown that for any map, if you define adjacency as adjacent states but in more than one point, then you get a planar graph. Okay. Now, why did I need uh, this in more than one point? So you need the more than one point because otherwise I could have uh, a map that looks like, let's say a Pentagon and all these states, these five states intersect at this point. And if I if I count that as an edge, then this would be a complete graph on five vertices. And there's no way to draw that in the plane without some crossings. So this is not planar. So some care is required. We can examine this again to figure out why the chromatic number is at least four, but okay. Um, and another thing, another example I wanna make about planar graphs. So, okay. So is this graph planar? So enter in the chat if you think yes or no. Okay, so everybody's saying yes. Okay, that's correct. And and the, the, the point is that this is planar because the, the statement is it can be drawn. It's not saying that every drawing has this property. So this graph can be drawn differently. It can be drawn like this, and then there are no crossings. Okay, so there's this amazing theorem, which was proven in the 1960s, which says that every planar graph can be four colored. Okay, so this property that you only need four colors for this, is not specific to this graph. Every planar graph can be four colored. Doesn't matter what you know what the degrees are, um, etc. So so this is a this is four. It's much more than maximum degree plus one. Now this proof occupies a kind of a special place in the history of math. So any questions about the statement before I say a bit about the proof? Okay, so, so, so what was the proof? So the proof is by induction, but the induction had about 230, uh, about 2000 base cases, some of which were really large. And then these base cases were checked by a computer. Just by finding colorings for them. So they're due to Oppel and Hocken. 
Actually, sorry, it's 1970, 1976. Okay. Now, this raised some questions because the first, first, this raised several different kinds of questions. So the first question was, what if the code is wrong? Right, so if you check something by computer, it means you write a program. But then what if your program is wrong? So then in the 2000s, people proved that the program is correct. And so finally, so, so now this actually is a mathematical proof, right? That so, somebody wrote a program and executed it and it output that yes, these all satisfy the induction, the whatever the induction statement is. And then some other people prove that the program is correct. And so that constitutes a complete proof. And so really there are two functions of a proof, right? So the first one is to demonstrate the truth of a statement. And you know this proof does actually do that after you prove that the program is correct. It's a complete, you know, it's a proof. However, the second and maybe more important feature of a proof is to explain why the statement is true. And these are these are different features. And this proof is not in not really satisfactory from this regard. And so this, this theorem has a weird status in that it's an important, like deep theorem about graphs. It's and you know, people really care about it. There is a proof. We know the statement is true, but the proof doesn't really concisely explain what the pattern is that makes the statement true. So this problem is still considered an active research topic. So one of the main open questions is, I mean, you know, if we do this, you'll be famous, is to find a, you know, a short, like clean proof of the statement. So this is not known. Currently the proof is, you know, very long, involves all these cases and so on. Okay, so any questions about this? Why are there so many base cases? Is there a reason for that at least? I mean, I don't know enough about the proof. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's it, it, it's some it's some pretty complicated induction. The induction is not something just like delete a vertex. So the inductive hypothesis is something complicated. Uh, the uh, and yeah, I don't. Um, I think you break it into statements saying that you know if graphs have one of these properties, then they're four colorable. And then eventually uh, the proof is like you keep reducing the graph to smaller and smaller graphs with those properties, but nobody really knows what the smallest graphs with those properties are. So you have to check, you just have to check a lot. I think now this has been reduced to a few hundred, but it's still, it's not something you can really, a human can check. So another remark is that this four, is really the difficulty here. The, if you just want to prove a five color theorem, that's easy, that's one page. I could have proved it in this class, but I didn't, I mean, we didn't get that far. So five color is much easier. And I'll send a link to the proof if you want to read it, but it's like maybe one page. So slightly changing a mathematical statement, I mean, as you know, at this point can make it like, way, way, way harder or false, but in this case, not false. Okay. I um, do have a question. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So I've been thinking about this maybe like from the break. So um, we know like proofs are essentially uh, built off of axioms and definitions and theorems and so forth. Have we, I guess with this in mind, have we ever encountered a point where a proof has been sound as in it's it's true based off of the rules of the structure mm -hmm. but uh after getting like evidence over i don't know even hundreds of years we find out that 
in actual reality for that thing they were looking at, it's actually not right. It's incorrect because now they have new information. But prior to that, as far as they saw, it's like, oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, the answer is no. So, 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 um, I mean, a- any theorem that we prove, for example, in this course, uh, so, th- I mean, the definitions are just, uh, you, you know, the definitions are by def- are, are tautologically true because they're just, you know, names for particular, um, I guess, structures. Of the, you know, the, the, the definitions don't, their truth value is not in any doubt. And then how do we get to these theorems given the definitions? Well, we don't, we never use anything that's suspect. We only use these like baby steps of logical reasoning. And so really for the out, for the conclusion to be wrong, one of those steps would have to be wrong. And those steps are really tiny, very easily verifiable steps. Like, you know, basic rules of, uh, of logic that, that we study in the beginning of the course. So, so, you know, a purely mathematical statement, once it's proven, will always be true. There's no, there's no, there's no way to, uh, to change that. But if you change the definitions, then of course the truth value could change. And so maybe your question is about, sometimes we use math to study the real world, right? Yeah. And then there's a modeling step in that where you, you turn a real world problem into a math problem. And the, the, you know, the math problem is its own little universe. Once you accept the definitions and you prove something is true, it's always gonna be true. But maybe in that modeling step, you know, maybe that was it, not the right way to model the phenomenon. And then maybe whatever's happening in reality indeed doesn't work the way you thought. But that's not a issue with the proof. That's an issue with the modeling. With choosing the definition. Have we run into something like that? Well, it, I mean, it kind of happens in physics all the time, right? Like physics is basically using math to describe nature. And, you know, the laws of physics are, I mean, they're not really laws, right? They're, they're, they're something that we, uh, you know, that there's some kind of mathematical statements that we believe, well, to be true to some degree, but they're not, um, we don't actually know that, right? The only way we know to check that is through experiments. And so in theoretical physics, you know, often you say, given, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity, all these other things are true. That's true. That implication is always true. But are the original rules, laws of relativity, are they actually true? I mean, that's not a mathematical statement. That's a statement about the world. Does that answer your question? So when we have like math publications, this is a little bit separate, but I guess intertwining. When we have math publications, I've read that sometimes like up to a third of the proofs they later realize were wrong. That's more for a human error issue as opposed oh. to uh, an update of information kind of issue. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, so this is a fact that many published mathematical proofs are wrong. And they're wrong because they contain logical fallacies, like the, exactly the type of thing we were discussing to how to avoid in the beginning of the course. So, so uh, you know, a, a, a logically sound proof cannot be wrong. I mean, it, it can never be contradicted if it's correct. But, you know, published mathematical proofs often have, you know, are hundreds of pages long and they're written by human beings and they often just contain mistakes. So yeah, if you, if you do, if you make a mistake, then yeah, then it's not a it's not a sound proof. So this is this is an absolutely true statement about the practice of, of math in real life. Yeah, it's a great question. I had a question about coloring. Coloring, uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Could we say that the chromatic number of a graph is less than or equal to the largest complete graph? That's a subgraph. So that's a great question. Um, is the chromatic number of a graph at most the size of the largest complete graph? That's a subgraph. 
So it's a great conjecture. It's not true. But uh, I mean, okay, so let me think, uh, let me try to think if I know of a simple counter example. Mm -hmm. Basically, there are examples of graphs that don't contain any triangles whose chromatic number is as large as you want. So this is a very good conjecture, but it turns out to be false. Now, graphs for which the chromatic number is equal to the largest complete graph, I think those have a name, let me just check. Yeah, okay. So this is called a perfect graph. A graph in which the chromatic number is the size of the largest clique, the largest complete graph contained in the graph, that's called a perfect graph. So these are, it's a very interesting and large, you know, class of graphs, but um, it's, uh, yeah, it's not true in general. So here's a, here's a link to a, Sorry, uh, I'll post it to everybody. Here's a link to perfect graphs if you want to learn more about those. But it's a great question. This is exactly the type of question that people ask in graph theory. You know, when does one graph theoretic property imply another one? And yeah, there's a lot of hidden structure in graphs. I mean, that's somehow the whole beauty of the subject. I mean, more generally in math that, you know, what do these theorems articulate? They articulate things that are always true but it's kind of, you know, it's some sort of a hidden pattern. Any more comments, questions? Okay, so let me make some sort of general closing remarks on the course. So, so the content of the course, or let me use a new page, really was split into two different types of things that we learned. So the, the most important thing that we learned in this course is some, is what I'm gonna call foundations of how to think mathematically and rigorously about propositions, and, and their proofs. So, so in, in this side, I would include, okay, we learned logic. And, you know, the, the things we learned on the first day are really some of the main takeaways from this course, namely that math is about propositions. And a proposition is a statement that's either true or false. That's actually a very powerful idea that statements are either true or false. Uh, and then, you know, we learned about, uh, uh, you know, other logical structures that we can use to precisely uh, speak about mathematical objects. So we talked about, uh, you know, quantifiers, uh, variables, logical connectives. And then we had the notion of a proof. And a proof really has two important properties. One is that it's clear, which means you shouldn't be able to turn it into a sequence of formal logical statements. And the other is that it's correct, which means that it's logically sound. So each statement follows from the previous ones by rules of inference. So this is really a sort of a restricted form of, of thinking and of language that we learned. And then we learned a bunch of proof techniques which are different logical structures of arguments that come up a lot. So we learned, you know, contrapositive, contradiction. And then finally we learned induction in chapter five, which is really just an extension of these proof techniques. So this all fits within the stru structure, uh, you know, the logical structure of math. And this applies to all areas of higher level math. And then the other sort of foundational thing that we learned that will apply to the rest of your mathematical life is we learned about sets and functions. And these are the basic uh, structures that we use to define mathematical objects.
Now, this is very different from the other type of content that we learned in the course, which is somehow, you know, specific mathematical content, specific, actually, you know, areas of math. And here, there are really four different little areas of math that we developed from scratch. And this is another key feature of this course. We didn't use anything from other courses. I didn't ask you to believe anything just because I said so. We derived everything from scratch. And so the four things we did here were number theory, um, counting, uh, probability, and graph theory. And I'm not going to list all of the subtopics in all of these subjects that we did. But the first thing I want to note is that all of these things were actually described in terms of sets and functions. So we really did end up using this stuff. Right? The other common feature that all of these things had or were supposed to have is that these are we created these subjects from scratch um, and you really had, uh, you know, you, we introduced new definitions that were maybe unfamiliar and you really had to, uh, to rely on the definitions um, to, to understand what was going on in these areas. So that's why these subjects were chosen in this class. There's a reason why we didn't, start off by proving things about calculus. And the reason is that you already have a lot of preconceived notions about calculus. And it's, uh, it's, it's easier to start in some fresh you know, mathematical area. And also proving things about calculus is much harder. If you, you will do that later in Math 104 or something like that. Um, and OK, and, uh, let's see. So. I don't, I, yeah, I, I'll send you a study sheet enumerating the different, uh, you know, subtopics in, in each of these areas. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is, um, you know, what, what, what was the difference between counting and probability? Uh, I would say the key difference is uh, we had these notions of events and random variables which are really just subsets and functions, right? That's not a new concept. The really new concept in probability is condition, conditional probability. So I would say that this is really the soul of probability theory, understanding how conditional probability works. It's a, it's a way of doing counting, which is much more powerful than just counting things from scratch. Um, in counting, I would say the key principles were, you know, the main principle was if you want to count a collection of objects, you want to use a process to count that collection. So use processes to count objects. And then, you know, these processes relied on some simple rules such as the sum rule, the product rule, and the division rule. And then there were some, you know, basic counting formulas. Maybe four different formulas for permutations, combinations, etc. And the whole idea was to use was to use these uh, this framework of processes and of uh, these different rules to break down complicated situations into simpler ones. And in probability, I would say the the whole point is to use this formalism of random variables, conditional probability, and events to break down complicated you know, events and, and, prob and uh, expectations into simpler ones. Now graph theory, okay. Uh, again, it, it, was, it, it, it was sort of its, its, own, its, its own little world that we created from scratch. We had very simple concepts like, you know, edges, adjacency, degrees, things like that. And uh, I would say the reason graph theory is included in this course is that uh, there are lots of hidden connections between very simple concepts.
and it's really um, it's really the first time where you experience uh, mathematical writing that's very different from computation. There were no equations, almost no equations in this graph theory section of the course. You're just writing paragraphs precisely talking about well-defined concepts that were ultimately just defined in English. So, so, so this is one uh, sort of new thing that maybe you experienced for the first time in this course. So um, I don't know. So this is precise writing, but without formulas. So, you know, I remember when I, when I, before I took a course like this, I thought math, in order to be really math, something has to be written in formulas. But this is not true. Graph theory is as rigorous as any other branch of math. It's, it's just as precise, but it's, it's written in English. So yeah, that's sort of a very high level overview of what went in the course. And, and I would say that, that, you know, apart from this content, I would say that the, um, uh, I would say that the, the main thing that I would emphasize about proof writing, so one is precision, by which I mean that all statements, definitions, and proofs uh, must be precise enough to turn into formal logic. I'm not saying you actually have to do that, but this is what really defines mathematical writing, that it's, it's clear. And there's this tension that it has to be clear, like absolutely precise, but also readable. And that's part of the art of mathematical writing that, you know, is a bit of a struggle initially, but which I, I hope you, you learn through writing proofs in this course. And, 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 you know, why is this precision so essential? Well, this precision is needed for two reasons. So one is that propositions are either true or false. And if something is not precisely specified, then it cannot be a proposition. But, you know, a, a more uh, actually kind of uh, substantial reason is that if you look at the proofs that we, if you look at, some of the more complicated proofs that we came up with, like the proof for Euler's theorem. This had lots and lots of, we chained together lots and lots of small statements to come up with a big statement, namely the theorem that was true, right? And, and the reason we could do that is, that is that each statement was precise. So precision enables uh, long chains of reasoning. Okay, and this is another really distinguishing feature of math that you, you can write a proof that's 100 pages long. And, you know, all you have to do is check every little implication and you can do that, right? It might take a while, but there's nothing mysterious about it. You just check every line. And, you know, the, the only way that you can rely on this is that all the statements are precise and, and checkable in this mechanical way. Otherwise, it's like a game of telephone, right? That by the end, you've lost, you know, maybe you've lost the meaning or... So, so this is one thing. Uh, the other takeaway from this course is I hope you learned how to read and write proofs. And specifically what I mean by that is when you, you know, when you read a proof, very specific things are supposed to happen in your mind, right? You're supposed to keep track of the logical structure. You're supposed to know what's on the table. I mean, I, I emphasize this a lot, but this is maybe the difference between reading a mathematical proof and just reading, you know, just reading something else written in English. Something very specific is supposed to happen in your mind. Um, and then finally, um, through experience, uh, the other thing, the other goal of the course was to 
I have an introduction uh, to you know how to come up with proofs. And how to find a proof is is very different. Off, I mean, as you've probably seen from doing the homework, the process of finding a proof is very different from the process of writing a proof. You don't just start writing at the beginning and end at the end. You do all kinds of stuff in the middle that actually looks very different from the final written proof itself. And this this process of distilling your thoughts into a proof uh, is something that's used in you know in all future future mathematics. Okay, so so that's yeah, that's kind of a high level picture of how the course was organized. Uh, let me make some um, some sort of uh, philosophical and psychological comments. So one is that uh, you know we had. There's a philosophical question of what is math, and I, you know, one point of view is that math is the collection of all if-then statements. I think that's a that's not, I mean, that's a very dry definition, but that's actually in in a way that's what we did in this course, right? We produced if-then statements. If you believe this definition, then this other thing, other proposition, has to be true. And this kind of speaks to Monique's question that you know the the if then statements being true doesn't mean that the if the hypothesis is always true. Um, another way to look at it is that uh, math is a form of knowledge uh, that can be uh, transferred between any two people. Uh, in, in the sense that if I want to convince somebody of a mathematical statement, I just give them the proof and there's nothing personal about it. They can, you know, they can run the proof in their own mind and they will believe it. So it's a, it's a way of convincing people that's in some way universal. Um, and about proofs themselves, like what do I find magical about them? Well, I want to emphasize that a proof is a finite uh, piece of reasoning. So proof is ultimately just a finite piece of text. But it tells you something about an infinite number of situations, right? Like all these proofs about graphs, they really tell us something about all graphs, and there are infinitely many graphs, right? So that that uh, applies to an infinite number of objects. And that's really the, that's the power, you know, that's the explanatory power of a proof. Um, okay, psychologically, I want to end with one last remark, which is the process of writing, I said this in the first lecture, the process of clear writing is very closely related to the process of clear thinking. Okay, so in order to write a clear proof, you have to think uh, clearly. Uh, sorry, that's this arrow. And the process of writing itself will help you think clearly. So this is one skill that I hope, even if you're not a math major, if you're gonna go do something completely different, uh, this is one very universally applicable skill that you learn from writing proofs, which is distilling your thoughts in this very rigorous format leads to greater clarity. Anyway, so that's that's it for the course. So, so thanks a lot. So I um, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, uh, all the best for finals. And I guess I'll see some of you in office hours. Any comments, you. questions? Yep, thank you. Thank you. It was super amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Shrivastava. Oh, thank you. Oh, nice icon. <laughs> yeah. <You're pretty>. Okay. <laughs> no comment.
Thank you, Professor. I love the class, and I, I wanted to learn uh, to learn logic badly before um, before taking it. Oh right, yeah, I remember. Yeah, thanks for participating. So. Yeah.